Hello and welcome to Books and the World. I'm John DeCoco, your host for this segment. Books in the World is an interview show produced by the Cape Cod Writer Center and the Cape Media Center. The Writer Center was established over six decades ago and sponsors a four-day writers conference every summer on Cape Cod. The goal of Books in the World is to show how writers, illustrators, publishers, editors, and others in the literary field play their roles in the world of books and other communication media. The show has been broadcast continuously since 1978, making it the longest running program of its kind in the United States. Today, we're delighted to welcome Stephen McCauley, author of You Only Call Me When You're in Trouble, published by Henry Holt Publishing, New York, and just released this year in hardcover. Before we get to this fascinating novel, we'd like to let readers know a little bit about you. And um, as an organization of book and communications people, we're always interested in the success of writers. You were born in Woburn? I was born in Woburn and grew up in Woburn Woop. and went to Woburn High. In Woburn High, all right. Yes. When Woburn was a very different place than it is right now. Okay. Uh, it was much more working class. Uh, it was, there were you know, a lot of rose growers in Woburn. Uh, there was actually farmland, there were pig farms, leather tanneries, um, and a lot of that stuff has now been replaced with townhouse developments and condominiums. So. The, the, the sports teams are called the tanners. That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, the, and that whole tannery business is what led to the situation that was profiled or, or described in a civil action by right, uh, John right, Hunt. right. The poisoning of the of the waters, the and that sort of thing. Wells, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And you escaped that. Um, Hopefully, so far, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> now you're living in Cambridge, and you teach writing at Brandeis. Yes, you're the co-director. Yes, of the writing program. We have a somewhat small creative writing program that's under the umbrella of the English department and. Uh, Elizabeth Bradfield, who is a poet who lives down in Truro, uh, is my co-director in poetry, and I manage the fiction side of things uh, for that program. So, and you teach uh, a cohort of several students. Uh, uh, yeah, we have small workshops of twelve students oh. uh, mm -hmm. at maximum, which is kind of an ideal number. Yeah. Um, someone I know who's been teaching writing for a long time, actually I've been teaching writing for a long time, says that any student above twelve in a workshop counts as two because <laughs> you know you have to, there's so much reading and personal engagement. So, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So, success, uh, seven novels. This is my eighth. This is your eighth, yeah. plus two under a pseudonym. That's correct, yes. Um, I went through, uh, some of the titles are awesome, and, and titles are so key, as is important as, as cover art, I think. Uh, my Ex-Life, right. uh, Alternatives to Sex, uh, Insignificant Others, I, I just, <laughs> they're just great, great titles. And then the next one was The Man of the House, How Mundane. That's true. Well, it was sort of a mundane book, to tell you the truth. Um, the original title of this book was The Responsible Party. Oh. And, um, that would fit. That, that would fit. fit. It, yeah. it, it actually fits for all the characters in different ways, and I thought it was the perfect title. But my editor said, you know, that's not a good title because it doesn't sound like a fun read. <laughs> and nobody wants to read about responsible people. And I thought, yeah, she's kind of right. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. r responsible people, happy people, successful people, unless they have bad marriages or drug problems, uh, they're probably not ideal for uh, a novel. Um, so this kind of hits the same note, but it's a little more engaging. And I think we all know somebody in our life who only calls us when they're in trouble. A friend of mine, I was, I was driving out to Western Mass uh, last week, and I called a friend of mine, and he said, you know, you should have called your book, you only call when you're driving and listening to an audio book you're not interested <laughs> in <laughs> finishing, um, which is, there's that as well, so. Yeah. That's terrific. Uh, three of your novels have been made into films. Uh, the Object of My Affection with Jennifer Aniston and Paul Rudd. Um, that book came out in 91. Uh, 87, actually. 87, okay, yeah. all right. I, Even the, further the back. The edition I had was 91. Yeah. Um, 
<clears throat> several years later, you get a phone call and somebody says they want to make a film. Well, what does that feel like? What, what goes yeah. through your head? Do you go out to the Mercedes dealership right away or what? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the book came out in 87 and it was, it was published by Simon & Schuster, but it was considered sort of a, you know, a small book, which in 1987 had a, a narrator who was a gay man and that was not nearly as um, mundane a thing as it, as it is now. It wasn't nearly as accepted. Um, and then the book got a very nice review which surprised everyone in the New York Times book review. Um, and it was very prominently featured. And after that, um, there was a lot of movie interest. Um, and A lot of movie interest. Yeah, there so. were several producers no and kidding. folks. Mm -hmm. and, and some independent producers kind of dangled the possibility of me writing the screenplay as, you know, kind of like, we'll let you do this. And, and the agent I had at the time said, you know, it's really tough to get movies made and you should just go with someone who's going to take control of this and do it themselves, um, which I appreciated because I have never particularly wanted to write screenplays. I really thought of myself as a, you know, writing narrative fiction. And, um, and it took 11 years to for that movie to yeah. get to the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very <coughs> happy not to be involved in the ups and downs of that, so. You're given credits in the film though, right? Did you, did you yeah. contribute to the screenplay or? I didn't. You didn't? The, the okay. screenplay was written by Wendy Wasserstein, who was oh, yes, a very yes, well-known playwright yeah. who won a Pulitzer and a Tony, the Heidi Chronicles, the Sisters Rosenzweig. And uh, she, really put her own spin on it. So the, the novel and the movie are very different stories, uh, very different characters, different social class, milieu, all of that. Um, but she's the reason that the movie got made because she really wanted the movie to get made and she had a lot of contacts um, in the world of film and theater, obviously. And uh, she stuck with it. and. It got made. And so. thank you, Wendy. And yes. thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> yes, I was greatly. I was you had two films that uh, were made in France. Yeah, um, and that was a very different experience, um, obviously. Uh, but my books have been translated into French and have done pretty well there. And uh, w the the main difference I would say is that the French directors and producers, this was just my experience, were much more interested in having my approval of what they were doing mm. and uh, input into the script and so on. And, um, and that was surprising to me. Um, and, and I like those movies very much. They're not easily available in the US, um, but they're, they're quite good. You did work on a screenplay of those, right? Um, I you contributed to I mean, screenplays. I would say that I read them and commented and made notes <laughs> okay. and that sort of thing, but no, I'm not credited as a co-writer. You spent some time in France. Yourself. Yes. Yeah. I, I Did you have connections over there beforehand, or no? I went to school there as a senior in college, um, mm -hmm. and you know, allegedly studied at the University of Nice, um, although as I have discovered as a teacher, typical, uh, didn't do a whole lot of studying, but um, I did pick up some l language skills there, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Very good. Let's get more specifically to you only call when you're in trouble. Um, this could be a movie. This could definitely be a movie. I'd love to see it as a movie. Um, do you write with the idea in any kind of cinematic um, frame of mind or, or not? Um, I, I, no, I don't at all, really. I mean, I think that my, um, I'm always surprised when my books have been optioned for films because I think of them as very much character-driven, um, not so much plot-driven. Um, they tend to be a little bit digressive, you know? There a lot, there's a lot of uh, ruminating by the characters and observing things and commenting on it. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I mean, one of the things I would like to think that the reason um, 
a number of them have been made into films and optioned is because they have very strong characters, and that appeals to actors. Um, yeah, sure. So, sure. but it really was. Um, I mean, this this novel began was kind of inspired by a house that a friend uh, owned in Woodstock, New York, and she bought this massive. Uh, 18th century <coughs> barn that had been converted into a performance space and a gallery with very opulent living quarters on the top floor. and um, Which is the setting of most of the book. Which is the setting of most of the book. And, and this became a huge white elephant uh, for this friend. And um, I began writing about someone who was from the Boston area who bought this piece of property and uh, was burdened by it. Um, and so that that was the inspiration for it. Bought it and burdened by it. Yeah. Because Dorothy, the main character, yeah, is is prone to make bad choices. She's prone to make <laughs> bad choices. And that was the other inspiration for this novel is that a friend of mine I was having lunch with told me that uh, she has always had to consider her sister in her own retirement planning. And her mm. sister is a very intelligent, talented, professional person. And I thought, why does she need to be taken care of, you know? And the answer is that uh, her, this, my friend's sister just is, refuses to take advice, personal or professional, from anyone and just kind of goes ahead with this somewhat unrealistic optimism. And I began thinking about what it would be like to be responsible uh, for such a person in your life. And so that, that was kind of the other thread that led into this book. Great, great. She takes us on a journey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amusing, it's sad, it's scary. It's, uh, she's, yeah. the things, the choices she makes, makes you shake your head. And yeah. her relationship with her daughter is, um, how would you describe that? Well, I, I mean, it's, it's a somewhat contentious relationship in the sense that, um, you know, Dorothy, the mother, is, a, I hope, is a, an appealing character, one of these people in your life that you um, admire for their optimism, for their energy, for their encouragement of other people, um, but you perhaps would not want to be responsible for taking care of them because Dorothy does make bad choices. She does move. Um, blindly into places and positions and career choices that get her into a great deal of trouble. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, so she's the kind of person you <coughs> might enjoy being around if you didn't have to be responsible for her. Well, you have one, uh, one descriptive statement, uh, one statement of hers that uh, it may not always be successful, but at least I'm always interesting. Yes. And I, yes, you are. Yes, yeah. you are, Dorothy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a theme in the book um, comes around uh, Title IX. Uh, early on, we learn that Cecily, uh, the daughter, Dorothy's daughter, is a junior faculty member. She's in trouble in her small, small college, her fictional college, um, and she's being reviewed for a possible violation of Title IX. And for our uh, viewers, under Title IX, discrimination on the basis of sex can also include sexual harassment. So tell us what she's, she's going through uh, as the book progresses with that. Yeah, Cecily, as you <laughs> said, is, is Dorothy's 34-year-old daughter. She's written one uh, academic book that unexpectedly became a bit of a crossover success because it deals with some political issues that were very much in the air. And, uh, and now she has this teaching position at this small uh, college in the Midwest which in my mind was a little bit like Lake Forest College, just as a you know, visual setting, nothing about the actual makeup of the school. But, um, and uh, she's teaching a course in which a lot of students are distracted and not particularly engaged, except for one student who is very engaged. And, um, and brilliant. And brilliant, and does all the reading and does all the extra reading. And Cecily is so flattered by this and so pleased 
um, that she doesn't stop the student from coming to her office all the time, from sending to e emails too frequently, that kind of thing. And it leads to this terrible misunderstanding. Um, and, and my feeling is that Cecily is responsible, this is the, the word du jour, um, uh, for, for not creating stronger boundaries. Um, but she's not guilty of what she is accused of, um, which is kind of inappropriate sexual behavior with her. And because I'm in academia, as we've said, and you know, have been teaching for 35 years now, I've seen the way expectations for what student-professor relationships um, should be like change over time. And it's very charged <coughs> right now. It's very, uh, everyone is a little bit on edge about things. I mean, frankly, I'm hesitant to close my office door if I'm talking mm. to students. Understandably, um, yeah. And, and the, this aspect of the novel was kind of based on an experience that I had with, with a student who I got a phone call one night at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, and a student in my class said, I'm having trouble sleeping, will you tell me a story? <laughs> And I said, uh, no, um, but you know, there are stories in the anthology, you can read one of those and I'll see you in class next week. Will you read me a story? <coughs> did, did he have his binky with him or her? Or her I, I don't know, <laughs> I'm happy to say I don't know. But I, I, I was terribly yeah. dismayed by this, yeah. despite the fact that I didn't think there was any you know, nefarious uh, reasons for it. But, uh, and I called my chair the next day and I said, look, this happened last night. Good for you. And he said, before I had even finished telling the story, he said, why do your students have your phone number? Mm. And I said, well, I've, I've always given my students my phone number as a way of getting in touch. It precedes email and my teaching does. Um, and he said, well, that's got to stop. So I thought that I was telling a story about this inappropriate behavior by the student and it before I even got to that, it was my inappropriate behavior in giving out my students my phone number, oh. which stopped then and there. Right. I had never which done it since. I don't think a lot of people would see as inappropriate, but there you are. That's what happens, yeah. maybe. It's it's very. As the book progresses, the it it feel it felt to me as a reader um, that the situation got murkier and murkier and and murkier for Cecily. She wasn't sure if she was guilty or naive or, you know, what had I what have I done to create the situation or what could I have done to prevent it and she's, she's struggling with that. Right. And I think, you know, in my situation that, I, that I've just described, I was very aware of the fact in moving forward with that student um, to maintain a distance, <laughs> but then if I'm doing that, am I creating, am I escalating the situation? Am I implicitly accusing her of something? Um, so, you know, these questions are very complicated. And frankly, that makes it really fun to write because everything has subtext. You know, when you're in a kind of situation like that, you say, hi, how are you doing? And you know that that could be interpreted three different ways by, by the person. And those kinds of scenes are really fun to write, the kind of scenes that none of us would want to be in ourselves. You do have fun with your writing. Your, your observations are fantastic. Um, the, uh, such as um, Cecily's mom, Dorothy, decides, this is how the book starts, decides to spill a long hidden fact. And <coughs> she'd been keeping the secret for a long time and now she's going to tell it. But the way she portrays it in her own mind is, in your words, she hated to paint herself as a liar, especially as a result of telling the truth. Yeah. And <laughs> there's a lot of truth telling, not telling, uh, withholding throughout the book. Right. In all the characters, or most of the characters. Yeah. And that, that's great fun. And you make a lot of fun of it. Well, I, I think people's personal interpretations of what being truthful means um, is something I'm very interested in. And I think Dorothy is the kind of character who, um, you know, if it seems like this is more true to my character to keep this lie hidden, then, then that's as good as, you know, telling the truth, so. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Oh, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention this. Um, speaking of truth, I urge readers to find your short story, The Whole Truth, which was published in Harper's. It's uh, years ago. Oh, thank you for reading it. Years ago. <laughs> it's a lie upon a lie upon a lie upon a lie, yeah. and it's hilarious. Yeah. Just go find it. Go find it. You, it, the thing is online, actually printed online. Yeah, somewhere. it's on, it's on my website. I it's think. On your website, okay, right. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's that's about a woman who tells a very small lie to her psychiatrist. Yep. And then she realizes, well, if she acknowledges <laughs> that she told a half truth, then everything she said is going to be interpreted as a falsehood, and she just digs herself deeper and deeper. Deeper and deeper. And that came out of a personal experience where I was in therapy. I mean, I've been in therapy my whole life, basically, but um, I was in therapy and I wasn't being 100% truthful. And it just got more and more complicated. And finally, I did the mature thing, which was leave that therapist and start all over again with someone. Not tell know. the truth, but believe the therapist. Exactly, right. yes, because the whole doing that would have been too painful and too complicated. Right. And, right. Um, uh, um, a, a major theme that we need to touch on, we've got a few minutes left, is um, your obligations to each other. Um, what are your obligations in a family? What are our obligations to friends? Um, the question of personal responsibility, as you've already raised, there are so many um, interactions that are, that are in play here. Tom, for Uncle Tom, who's a central character, we haven't even mentioned him yet. He's mm. Cecily's uncle, yeah. and he's the one who gets you only. He's the one who gets called right. when Cecily's in trouble. Um, Tom, for his, his sister, Tom also cares for his sister. What's his responsibilities to her, and the mother and daughter for each other? There's such a, um, a wide-ranging dynamic between the two of them. Um, the, the, you know, the the, the question that overhangs this book um, is, is it ever all right to stop taking care of someone else in your life and start living your life for yourself? Um, and that's the question that Tom is faced with. You know, can he let go of what he sees as his obligations to um, his sister and his niece and pursue his own career late in life? Um, and I, it, I didn't want to deliver a heavy message because that's not the kind of writer I am, but I feel as if we're living in a period where good citizenship and making sacrifices for other people is somewhat devalued. And I kind of wanted to make a case for someone who is late, later in his life, he's in his early 60s, um, as I was five years ago, um, and uh, you know, who has to accept that this is what he's done, these are the sacrifices he's made, and make his peace with it. And I think there's something admirable in that, so, yeah. He does take on a lot, um, and plus he's dealing with his own relationship problems. Right. With, uh, with Alan, right. who's left him. He's not sure if Alan's left him. He doesn't want Alan to leave him, but Alan seems to be drifting away. Right, right. And that's going on in the background, too. Right. Plus, he's got his professional uh, concerns. Uh, he's an architect designing a s with a specialty in small houses, tiny houses. Right, right. Tiny houses are big now, if I could say that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, why tiny houses? Why, why is that a specialty? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I put that in there because I'm really interested in small spaces. I love small spaces. I'm most comfortable and focused and uh, kind of at peace in small spaces. Um, but I live with someone and have for the past 30 plus years who's claustrophobic. And so I don't get to hang out in them uh, as much as I would like. And uh, so, so I've spent hours, hundreds of hours probably, I'm ashamed to say, uh, looking at videos about tiny houses. And hmm. I thought, oh, I could use that, I could consider that research and put that into the novel. But then I realized that it was kind of a perfect subspecialty for this kind of character who doesn't want to take up too much space in the world, who wants to live modestly and um, thoughtfully. I see, all right. Yeah. So, so novel as self-therapy. Okay, got it. Yeah, well, right. unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. 
But as you know, the more problems you have for your characters in the novel, the more kind of forward more momentum fun. it has. More so. fun. Yeah. All right. Well, we're about um, close to wrapping up. I have one more question. Um, you have two quotes that I just have to get address. <coughs> your take on relationships. Compliments, this is quoting you, compliments from a partner of more than five years bear an uncanny resemblance to leftover pizza. Ouch. All right. Well. And, <laughs> and at a certain point in most long-term relationships, it's expected that public displays of affection will be, mo will be supplanted by public displays <laughs> of annoyance. Yeah. I have to ask, does somebody really brutalize you in a relationship? <laughs> No, I think I think that there's a way in which you know, like most people, I don't know. You know, I've got a, a, a nephew, and he's he's 27 years old, and he's got this new girlfriend, and they love each other very much, and they're all over each other whenever they're with you know that Christmas a dinner and all that sort of stuff, and everybody loves it. They think it's so cute and it's so wonderful, um, you know. If you see people who've been together for a long time <laughs> doing that, it's just a little bit. It's a right on an observation. Cringy, you know. It's what a I'm right saying? on observation. I yeah. apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we want to thank you very much, Stephen McCauley, for sharing your just released novel. Um, it's available on Amazon and many places and bookstores right now, and also at stephenmacaulay.com. And um, if you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more, you'll find links to them through our website. Cape Cod Writers Center org through our Facebook page and on YouTube. Thank you for watching Books in the World and thank you, Stephen McCauley. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. much.